welcome Dr. Co Dr. Kaufman and Dr. Pisanek, and I'm excited to get started, ask you some questions. So my first question is to Dr. Kaufman. Can you remind us why prevention and early detection for ovarian cancer is so important? Sure. Hi, Donna, and hi, everybody. Hi. Thank you uh, for inviting me to be here today, and obviously, thank you for the, the amazing support from Tina's Wish. Um, I, I will clarify, I'm, I'm actually a medical oncologist, uh, but I focus in gynecologic cancers. Uh, I, I, I see women largely with ovarian cancer clinically, and my lab focuses on ovarian cancer research. And so, you know, why is prevention and early detection important? Uh, the short answer is that's how we cure ovarian cancer. So if we are able to find cancer either before it starts, if we can prevent it from starting, obviously not having cancer ever would be the best case scenario. But the second best case would be if we can find it early, particularly before it's spread. Because we know once cancer cells have moved and spread and found their way to other parts of the body, that's when it's really difficult to make that cancer go away, stay away, or cure it. So if we have early detection strategies where we find it right when it starts and we can get rid of it then, that's how we make this cancer completely go away. And you know, we, we know that works because we've done it in things like breast cancer and, and colon cancer and then multiple other cancers that we do have kind of screening strategies for. And if we find it in an early stage, we can treat it and make it go away. You know, I think the biggest problem with ovary cancer is A, we're still learning how this cancer forms. Um, you know, we're learning more and more that these high-grade serous cancers, like Donna, like your cancer, actually likely starts in the fallopian tube as a really teeny tiny change in the fallopian tube that spreads very quickly. And so it's, it's more of a challenge to find these small changes in the fallopian tube that we can't feel we can't, we can't effectively image. So that's what makes it hard, but that's why this research is critically important. And you do you know, a beautiful job describing your project through the seeds and soil analogy. But, um, so we wanted you to explain that analogy, but before, could you just tell the audience what a biomarker is? So everybody's on the same page. Sure, so, so a biomarker pretty simply is something that is that comes from the cancer or from the microenvironments the environment that surrounds the cancer that that can be used to detect, to detect that cancer so for example if a cancer cell has a certain change or secretes so um, lets off a certain protein so let's say something like ca125 which would, is a is one of the markers that we use in advanced ovarian cancer if that gets into the blood and we take a blood test and we can find that, that would be a biomarker of the cancer. The problem is CA125 is not perfect. And so we need better markers to be able to quickly and accurately detect the earliest stages of this cancer. And so basically it's just something that's cancer specific that we can find. Generally, we talk about it in blood. Sometimes we talk about it in other fluids like um, you know, pap smear related fluids, but just something specific to the cancer that we can detect. And then your other question was about, about the seed and soil hypothesis. Right. Um, great. So, so I, I will first say that this is not, this is not my hypothesis. It's, it's not my analogy. This is something that was actually first um, brought up by Stephen Paget in, in 1889. We were still just getting the infancy of cancer. And so the concept is that for a cancer to form, you need the cancer seed to find fertile soil to actually take root and start to grow. And so a lot of our research focuses on the seed itself, so the, the cancer, but we, we've kind of neglected the fertile soil that it grows in. So what my research and what Dr. Pasonic's research um, is, is focusing on is how this fertile soil forms and can we target that soil to either find a good biomarker or to actually prevent the fertile soil from forming as a way to prevent ovarian cancer from starting. So actually the project that, that uh, is, is supported by Tina's Wish is looking at 
in the fallopian tube, where we think most of these high-grade serous ovarian cancers actually start, we find that there are changes in, in the soil cells that actually happen before cancer starts. And kind of like a seed in soil, there's much more soil for each seed. And so while we focus on the changes that happen in this soil as cancer is starting, they're going to let off more, more of these biomarkers. So we actually may be able to detect that signal that's coming from the soil more so than coming from the seed itself. So this project is to, to basically find changes that are happening in the soil very early during cancer initiation and looking from the, that soil, can we find biomarkers that will be good early detection strategies? Thank you. And would you um, say that this approach is unique to your research or can you explain its uniqueness? Sure. And so, so in ovarian cancer, yes. Um, like I mentioned, most of our research really has been focused on the cancer seed itself. And, and we don't know about what changes are happening in the soil. Um, a lot of my previous research is looking at the changes in the soil once cancer is already established and often spread. And so this is unique for us as well, looking at the earliest stages in cancer initiation um, to see what changes are happening. And, and we actually have, have evidence that changes are happening before cancer starts. And these changes in the soil are actually influencing cancer initiation. So it's actually the soil that's contributing to the seed growth. Um, so this is pretty unique uh, for, for research in ovarian cancer initiation. Folks have, have taken similar approaches in other cancers. I, I think of liver cancer and colon cancer because we know things like liver cirrhosis or scarring in the liver contributes to liver cancer. So it, it's a concept that, that's been somewhat studied in, in other cancers. Okay, thank you. So now I have um, a couple of questions for Dr. Fasanek. Uh, first, I'd like to start, like how did the collaboration start between you and Dr. Kaufman? Well, actually, uh, Dr. Kaufman, Lan and I, uh, we met at a Tina's Wish symposium. And, uh, you know, yeah. I'd like to say it was a happy accident, but actually that's, that's part of the goal of Tina's Wish symposiums is to bring us researchers together and to see if there are ways that we can work together uh, to complement each other's expertise. And um, basically, uh, there was some overlap in our research between Lan and I, and um, I have an area of expertise that, that could have been helpful for, or is helpful, I guess, for Dr. Kaufman's uh, research. And so we just began uh, talking and we kind of hit it off right away. Okay, being in two completely different institutions, what's, what are the logistics of working together on a regular basis? So actually, it's not much different in the COVID era uh, to be <laughs> collaborating with somebody in a different institution. I, I do most of my meetings right now via Zoom, but I would say that one of the key things is, um, is really the rapport you establish as you work together. Um, you slowly gain trust with each other. It's kind of like building a friendship. And uh, when you really trust each other, um, and have a sort of informal relationship. You know, we just text each other and say, you know, do you want to talk about this? Or I have a question about that. Or did you see this? And um, because we're, you know, we're basically friends, you know, we can just hop on any time. It could be an evening. It could be a, a weekend. But really having that uh, nice, open communication is really important for all, all collaborations. Okay, thank you. And so far in the project, what has been the biggest aha moment or the most exciting developments? Well, we've just started on our, our on this particular project, but what really came before it um, was we started taking some of the um, methods that I developed in my other projects for looking at the changes that occur in the, the uh, early lesions in the fallopian tube. And that's challenging because uh, you only have a very small number of cells, but we took those methods uh, that we developed and said, well, what if we take those methods and start looking at the changes that occur around the lesions? And when we did that, <clears throat> we, we saw uh, major differences in the marks that are on the DNA uh, in the cells surrounding the lesions versus cells that are not near lesions. And uh, what that reason that was an aha moment is because <clears throat> most of Land's research has been on particular cells that are, that are relatively rare 
but we didn't necessarily expect that all the cells are starting to respond uh, and interact with these lesions um, to help them uh, basically, well, help <laughs> promote the cancer. <clears throat> and um, we did an experiment where we, we took a chemical, just actually hydrogen peroxide that you're familiar with, um, and that's to mimic what happens during the ovulation cycle. These chemicals get released and it actually uh, hurts the cells that are near the ovary. And it was, it's kind of, uh, normally those cells might die, but what we found is that the, the cells that are, uh, that land study actually help these cells survive and turn into cancer. So it was a kind of a smoking gun showing us that not only are the cancer cells important, but they need, they absolutely critically need these surrounding cells just to stay alive and, and progress. Thank you. And now another question to Dr. Kaufman. Um, what are the next immediate milestones and what do you need to reach those milestones? So I'd say that the next immediate milestones would be to, to do a comprehensive analysis of these DNA mark changes that Dr. That, that, uh, Dr. Pisanek was talking about in the, the soil cells that are directly underneath the early cancer seeds in the fallopian tube, and also to characterize the soil that is next to it. So not directly underlying, but next to it. Because what, what our early data is showing is there's actually a large field effects. You're changing a, lot, a large amount of the soil that's surrounding a small cancer seed. And so we want to know how far does that field extend um, to say kind of how much of, of, of the cells in the fallopian tube are at risk for changing into cancer seeds. And so we are planning on comprehensively analyzing these DNA marks in the soil underneath and around these cancer cell seeds compared to normal fallopian tubes. And that, that'll be critical to say, what are the changes? And then we can move forward to say, from those changes, what will be the best candidates for biomarkers that would actually be in the blood that we could detect early? So to be able to achieve these milestones, really the most important things are samples. So as Dr. Pisanek mentioned, these are tiny, right? And so we need lots of fallopian tubes with and without these early cancer changes to be able to get enough to understand what, what are the actual changes that are happening. Um, so I think that's, that's the biggest hurdle, but that's also why collaborations are so critically important, right? Both with Dr. Pisanek and, and our other researchers in the, the Tina's Wish family. Um, who have been fantastic collaborators and, and we actually work with outside of Tina's Wish as well. Um, so coming together to pool our resources to get these samples so, so we can actually do the research. Thank you. And Dr. Pisanek, what has been the biggest challenges, the biggest challenges and obstacles that you faced with the project? Well, uh, you know, I'd reiterate what uh, Dr. Kaufman uh, said, which is the samples, you know, for even a, a large hospital, uh, these type of samples with the lesions in them, you might only get, like Johns Hopkins is a huge um, medical institution, but they may only get 10, 15 of these samples a year. Um, and so we want to study, because we want to um, get enough samples so we can have confidence in these biomarkers that we identify, that they're specific. Um, that's one of the challenges. And then the other challenge is just dealing with these very, very small uh, pieces of tissue. And we actually have to use a laser to cut out the cells uh, at different uh, places on these tissues, and then to analyze those cells that we cut out with the laser. Uh, so that's challenging because you don't have a lot of material to work with and you're trying to get as much information as you can out of a very small amount of material. And that's, that's quite challenging. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Kaufman, how can people who are participating today and or help and or become involved in your work? Sure, so, so I think the, the, the most important thing is raising awareness. Um, oftentimes, uh, ovarian cancer is, is overlooked as a, as a major cancer that, that needs to be invested in for, for research. Um, we, we don't have the kind of the same 
you know, push as, as the, the pink ribbon breast cancer initiatives, which are all fantastic, but we do need to raise awareness that this is important, right? This is the most deadly gynecologic cancer and we have no screening early detection methods. And, and as you mentioned initially, our only way of, of prevention is in women that are high risk, that, that have genetic predisposition. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, is it, to, to go in and take the tubes and ovaries out. And, and so we, we put our women into surgical menopause. And that is honestly only for about 15% of, of, of ovarian cancer patients have these genetic predispositions. So, you know, we, we need to do better. And, and the world needs to realize that, that we need to invest and in, in to do better. And that's the only way we're going to move forward with, with curing this cancer. Um, so I, I think understanding that is important. Um, and then, you know, advocating for, for research, you know, we, we need to be able to have access to tissue. So, so you no, know, signing those consents to say, yep, the tissue that's already being discarded, we can use it to, to find these critical biomarkers. Um, and then, of course, research funding is, is incredibly important because, unfortunately, we can't do any of this without actually the money to, 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 um, to, to move the research forward. But I still think the most critical thing would, would be um, awareness. And, and the, the more we say this is a problem, the more we will have support to say we can then address that problem. Okay, thank you. So um, before we get to the questions and answers um, uh, part of our program, um, please submit questions to us. And, or as I said, you can either do it by um, raise hand feature or in the chat, either to everyone or to me directly. And um, I just wanted to share some exciting um, upcoming Tina's Wish programs and events. So the first one coming up is March 15th at 12 o'clock Eastern time is Empower Her webisode number four, Be Heard Advocating for Yourself as a Patient. And you can see the slide is up there. Um, and for those who have not heard about this initiative, the Tina's Wish Empower Her webisode and podcast series educates women on different topics relating to the gynecological health. Webisodes feature subject matter experts and moderators with personal connections to gynecologic cancers. This is an inclusive journey. Webisodes are 30 minutes and offered with English and Spanish closed captionings. There's no cost to tuning in, just simply register on the Tina's Wish website. And Tina's Wish is dropping the registration link for webisode number four in the chat now. There are also many meaningful and fun in-person events coming up this year. As you can see from the slide, some of these are happening in New York City, but others are regional events in Boston, Richmond, Virginia, and Washington, DC. And you have the dates there. And again, if you're interested in learning more or attending any of these events, you can check, with, check them out on Tina's Wish website, which is, and Tina's Wish is dropping the incoming events link in the chat. So now let's get back to the program and um, I want to get back to our questions. So the first question I have is, um, what types of differences are you seeing in early microenvironment versus the mic, I guess it's supposed to be macro environment of established cancers? So the question being, what, the, what are the differences we're seeing early versus late or yeah. early versus normal? I think it's early versus late. Early versus late. So, so the particular uh, soil cell that I study are they're called mesenchymal stem cells. So they're they're basically the the stem cell of the soil. So these are adult stem cells. We're not talking about embryonic stem cells or anything like that. But they are in almost every tissue in the body, and they're important for wound healing and regenerating the soil and normal normal tissue right after it's injured. And so when we've studied these in advanced cancer, they actually look almost identical 
to the mesenchymal stem cells that we see in the early precursor lesions. And so from those stromal cells look very, very similar. Uh, so, so, so there aren't significant differences between them, which I find fascinating because the disease itself is quite different. What is slightly different is, is how the rest of that microenvironment is, has changed. So, so the impacts in things like the immune cells that are present or not, the amount of things like blood vessels that are there to feed the cancer or not. So we see changes in these soil stem cells that are very similar to the advanced stage disease, but um, the rest of that kind of microenvironment that starts to develop and mature is not fully there yet. But I will also say that we haven't fully characterized the microenvironment in these early lesions. So there'll be more differences to come as we, as we study them in more detail. Okay, and I have another question about what can be done to increase the number of the number of fallopian tube samples. So uh, I can. Uh, it's kind of an interesting question. Um, you know, I'm working on uh, another project with another foundation called Breakthrough Cancer, and, and one of our key goals is to uh, inform the public of the opportunity for what's called opportunistic salpingectomy which is women that after they uh, finish their childbearing, um, if they're having another abdominal surgery, uh, they can actually opt to ha have their fallopian tubes removed. And that won't affect hormonal function, but it can dr drastically reduce the probability of, of getting ovarian cancer later in life. Um, I think this is a great uh, opportunity uh, in the sense of uh, the ability to remove a non-essential organ and drastically reduce uh, cancer prevalence is, is actually quite an opportunity. So in the coming years, uh, we expect that this potentially becomes standard of practice where women will be informed when they go in for any sort of surgery uh, in the abdomen that they'll have this option. And just to don donate those tubes that would uh, basically be discarded anyway, uh, will allow us to have a lot more material uh, to study. And I think I have a question for you. Um, I was once speaking at one of the Tina's Wish, um, you know, events with a gynecological oncologist, and he was telling me that in Canada they were doing that. They were removing the fallopian tubes, mm -hmm. and it had greatly reduced the number of ovarian cancer cases. Yes, there's been a few small pilot studies, relatively small, a few hundred women. Um, our uh, one of our goals is to actually make this standard of practice so that every woman is informed and has this opportunity. So. Uh, we think that's going to make a big difference. Um, we will also, you know, potentially start to learn um, if we identify lesions in the average risk women, average risk women, we'll start to learn what are the other biomarkers that we can identify, uh, basically, even in average risk women. Most of the tubes that we get right now are from high risk women, so they may have a different biology uh, than average risk women. Although I will add that that different institutions do different things. Things. And so a lot of a lot of our programs, a lot, of, a lot of our academic institutions that have interest in gynecologic cancers do do biobanking. And so we do have biobanking, meaning just taking all the tissues that would either otherwise be discarded and saving it for research opportunities, not necessarily just one specific. Um, so we do that at, at UPMC and, and I know at, at Hopkins they do as well. Um, but we have tubes from women that undergo hysterectomies for other reasons, or this, this concept of it, it's called an opportunistic salpingectomy, meaning when, when you're in the belly or having a surgery, you take those tubes out anyways. And so we are gaining a larger repository of these. And I think one of the critical ways to increase that tissue number is to connect more academic institutions together so that we're collaborative, not, not siloed by ourselves, but pooling our resources. And then uh, we had a question about, um, can the removal of the fallopian tubes be done laparoscopically? Yes. And um, it's actually a very uh, low risk, takes 12 minutes uh, additional surgery time uh, to take out the fallopian tubes. It's actually extremely low risk if you're already being opened up for another reason. Um, and so, I mean, from my, I, I, I don't have the opportunity to donate my fallopian tubes because I don't have any, but. Uh, if I were, could, I would definitely <laughs> uh, 
uh, do that because I think there's, there's, from what we've seen so far, there's little downside uh, to, to having the procedure. Right, and then actually we have a question from my daughter who wants to know, in my case, since my only symptom was postmenopausal bleeding, whether that should be a symptom flagged to those, um, you know, to, to gynecologist, you know, originally I went to the, my gynecologist, yeah. um, automatically to look for ovarian cancer, or it's such a rare, relatively rare symptom, is it not necessary to flag that along with the other major ones? So postmenopausal bleeding is actually one of the, the largest um, symptoms for endometrial cancer. So it should raise red flags, period, for, for evaluation of gynecologic organs. Um, anytime I hear postmenopausal bleeding, you want to say what's going on in the endometrium. It's, it's relatively rare as a symptom for ovary cancer, but it, it should flag further investigation. Just like you should, should have a pelvic exam, the cervix should be evaluated, the endometrium should be evaluated. Um, the reason that it's fairly rare for ovary cancer is generally you're not actually going to have lesions that will shed into the, into the endometrium and then out. So you're not going to generally have bleeding from that because what, what we understand right now is most ovarian cancers start in the fallopian tube or certain, certain ones start on the surface of the, of the ovary and then quickly spread into the belly, so spread up rather than spreading down into the endometrium or the uterus or you know, cervix, which is where you'd really find that, that postmenopausal bleeding. Okay, thank you. And then I guess we have time for one more question, which I saw. Um, oh, someone, uh, someone wants to know, how do you identify which women are high risk? Could you tell the audience that? <laughs> yeah, so, ahead, so we, we would define high risk um, by women that have a genetic predisposition, so that have a known, generally it's a BRCA mutation, which is BRCA1 or 2, like Donna was mentioning or have another mutation along the same kind of pathway, which is involved in DNA damage repair. You know, but most people don't know their genetic background, right? And so if you don't know, family history is also critical. So is there a family history of, of breast cancer at an early age, of any ovarian cancer? We also think about things like endometrial cancer and colon cancer, because there are different subtypes of ovarian cancer. And so there's a genetic syndrome called Lynch syndrome, which is, is, um, has increased risk for colon cancer and endometrial cancer and certain types of ovary cancers. So we look back at your family history, and those would be the biggest drivers for someone that is quote unquote high risk. You know, we, we know there are other risk factors of ovary cancer in terms of, um, um, you know, how, uh, how early you'd had, had uh, uh, started menstruating and number of children and things like that. But those risk factors aren't strong enough to be able to drive, put someone into that high risk category. So it really is family history and, and genetic background at this point. Okay, and then I have a couple of quick questions. Um, are ovarian adenomas considered like a cyst adenoma? Is that what we're talking about? Probably. The question just says adenomas. Yeah. So, so generally not. So generally, what we're talking about there are cysts on the ovary that are benign. Um, and, and I think that's what you mean by an, an adenoma, kind of like a colon polyp. Um, those are generally not associated with cancer. I, I say generally because there are some that have this the, a change that is similar to something called a borderline cancer or a, or a um, low grade cancer, but those are exceedingly rare. And those are also generally cured if you if you cut it out. So generally, if you have a cyst adenoma on, on the, the ovary, that's not considered a precancer lesion. Okay. And um, is there a correlation between the HER2 positive breast cancer treatment and high-grade serous ovarian cancer? 
is there a correlation between the treatment or the disease? Well, I'll, I'll ask both. I'll do both. So treatments, uh, no. It's the question says treatment. Right. So generally, just so no. So generally, we think of you know anytime we do anti-cancer treatment with chemotherapies, we we sometimes think about the risk of secondary malignancies because our chemotherapies are, are poisons, right? Um, those secondary malignancies generally tend to be blood cancers, so things like leukemias. So there really is not a, a risk in terms of breast cancer treatment and ovarian cancer. Um, certain breast cancer treatments like use of tamoxifen, can, which is a hormone treatment, can increase your risk of endometrial cancer. Um, that's slightly different. And then HER2 positive and spe specific, we generally use antibodies against HER2 like trastuzumab, which are also not linked to ovarian cancer formation. Um, there is a link between kind of genetic predisposition to breast cancers, not necessarily HER2 specific, but breast cancers and ovarian cancer, particularly in women that have BRCA mutations or um, whose tumors have BRCA mutations or the germline, or they have a, um, uh, um, sorry, I was trying to read what they said there. Um, totally lost my, my train of thought, but that genetic predisposition can link the two, but the treatment, not so much. Okay, and then um, very quickly for the last question, had, if you're in menopause because you're still, having, you're still bleeding, but how do you know it's not postmenopause, postmenopausal bleeding because a, a blood work determined that after an ovarian cyst rupture that uh, this woman was in menopause, but she, so how does she know it's not postmenopausal bleeding? Yeah, so sometimes those blood tests are unreliable. If you've had both of your ovaries out, then, then, you have been put into to menopause. If you had just a cyst removed and there's still some ovary there, you can still be you, you can still be cycling basically. The the question should be so so if if you stopped menstruating and then started again, that would be concerning for kind of postmenopausal bleeding. It's always hard to know each patient's you know subtleties. If there's a question, I would see their gynecologist. Um, and, and ask specifically ask that because it's pretty easy to look at the endometrium and make sure things are okay. Okay, and this is going to be the last question for sure because <laughs> you're running out of time. So um, this woman has no BRCA mutation, but she had triple negative breast cancer in 2001 and was diagnosed with ovarian cancer in November 2019. And she was, um, you know, no evidence of disease, June 2020. The two-year mark is here. How can I get, um, she wants to know how she can get involved in clinical trials. Well, thank you for sharing that and your interest in, in, in research. It's critically important. Um, you know, I think that the best thing to do would be ask your gynecologic oncologist about what trials are available. There are trials that are in the survivorship phase, which, which you are in, which is wonderful, and, and hopefully the cancer never comes back. Um, but th there are trials in that, in that phase, even trials that are, that are simply just following how you're doing. Um, there are also ways, right, to, to say, um, you know, can your tissue be used for research, things like that. You can ask your, your gynecologic oncologist if, if your tissues were banked. Um, and, and that would be a good resource for, for you know, collaborative research. But I think talking to your specific um, uh, doctor would be a good first, first place. Um, clinicaltrials.gov is like a clearinghouse for all trials. Um, also things like, you know, the Tina's Wish organization do a great job in terms of promoting trials. Um, so those would all be good resource, resources to say, what, what can you participate in now? Okay, thank you. So um, we wanted to stick to our timetable. So and I want to thank all our attendees this morning, as well as a very special thank you to Dr. Kaufman and Dr. Pisani.
We really um, appreciate you know your groundwork, groundbreaking work, and taking the time to speak with us this morning. Um, Tina Swish will follow up with a recording link of today's conversation, and to solicit your input and participation in Tina's Wish. Um, we plan to feature more research roundtables this year, so uh, stay tuned for details regarding the next one. And have a great day, everyone. Thank you again to our researchers and participants. Hi, everyone, and thanks for thanks for joining. Thanks.